isekai. While the genre has been taking over in recent years, it has a long and rich history dating back as early as 1976. It is widely considered to be the most popular genre in the modern anime scene, with it continuing to grow as each season goes by. And this popularity is widely attributed to the 2012 anime titled Sword Art Online. Nope, nope, I, I can't do this. this. This song gives me nightmares and I hate it. I've heard it way too much and all I can think of is that terrible show and the dumb, stupid legacy that it made. This whole genre is just so stupid. There's no substance in anything that's anywhere close to relating to isekai. It is filled with carbon copies that vary so slightly that you can predict the plot of any new isekai that's coming out. I can't even begin to describe my hatred for this genre. They all have this run-of-the-mill protagonist that probably has black hair because it makes them different from all the cookie-cutter otherworldly characters like the silver-haired elves or the blonde princess. Oh, and if they're feeling really spicy, they'll write that this black-haired protagonist is super overpowered or has an ability that no one else can get for some inexplicable reason. Maybe some sort of god sent them there, or, or maybe this magical being called truck will come and get them. It's a fucking truck. Stop personifying it. And why are literally all of them a harem? How and why are these people so obsessed with this foreigner just because he's a little bit strong? And even if they aren't that strong, they still have this flock of women surrounding them like they're god. Yes, ReZero is a harem. It's bad enough that this genre can't get a good protagonist, let alone side characters that have any importance. Seriously, when was the last time you watched an isekai that had genuinely interesting and unique characters? Even some of the top isekai right now, Mushoku Tensei, is riddled with bad characters that are only there to appeal to the fans and their sexual desires. And that's considered the best isekai. Can you imagine my surprise when I watched In Another World with my smartphone? A isekai so terrible, with characters that are so boring, I had fallen asleep multiple times. It has absolutely no when Sword Art Online was released. Because it was after that, the anime industry started to tank into the flaming dumpster that it is today. I cannot even stand to look at another isekai. I am so sick of the genre, and anything that has to do with it. But anyways, have you guys watched War on Geminar? This is Isekai no Seikishi Monogatari, or just War on Geminar in English. It's a 13-episode OVA that was released over the course of an entire year, starting in May 2009 and ending in May of the following year. It was released one episode a month, and to be fair, that is a lot of time between episodes, but it evens it out a little bit when each episode is about 45 minutes long. A quick math, and that gets you to a total runtime of over 9 hours. While my perception of time is terrible and I have no sense of relativity, it should be noted that this show is about as long as Shield Hero, just that there are half as many episodes, but each episode is twice as long. Which is a pretty long time for any modern show, and especially an isekai. Not only that, but it came from the combined efforts of two studios, namely AIC Spirits and B-Stack. And if you've never heard of either of those names, then shame on you. There are two studios that have put thousands of hours of work into creating your favorite shows like Tokyo Majin and Sasami Maho Shoujo Club. Yeah, okay, they may not be the most popular studios, and there's a good chance that you have never heard of them, but in general, their animation quality isn't that bad even if sometimes it looks like it's a PowerPoint presentation. But animation isn't everything, especially when a show has a plot this interesting. A plot that I should maybe start to explain. War on Geminar follows the story of a young boy, Kenshi Masaki, who has been sent to a foreign world much different from the one he once lived on. After being taken under the wing of an anonymous organization, he has been told to assassinate the newly crowned empress under the guise that he will be sent back to the world in which he came. Now, if that doesn't send chills down your spine. It is a little hard to get all of the plot into this small of a description, though. But it is a very basic description, and it gets much more interesting. There is an elephant in the room, though. And, uh, yes, it is an isekai. 
But I feel like I could persuade you into thinking that this is very different from the isekai of recent years, and I think I have a very good argument for it. It was made in 2009. I rest my case. Okay, so people who know isekai may understand what that means, but anyone new to anime definitely won't, so I'll explain for a short bit. Isekai is nothing new. The concept of sending someone to another world has been around for a while. That is, a concept that has not changed since the beginning. But what has changed is what they do after they arrived in this new world. Once the main character has landed in this new world, there are two different paths that they can go down that achieve very different results. The first route we will call, I like it here. The route takes the main character on a very long journey through this new land in order to accomplish... something. That something varies a bit from isekai to isekai, but the main idea is that they are going to become one with this world and spend the rest of their days on it. This route usually starts with the main character dying in the real world, only to be summoned by a god that tells them they have a second chance and proceed to be sent to a fairy tale world. It's the route that most modern isekai take. Modern being anything after 2014 or so. Some common anime that take this route are shows like Konosuba or That Assassin Isekai that has a really long name. Both of these shows start off by having the main character die on Earth. While the cause of death is different, they are both put in front of the presence of some god. That god goes through some sort of script about how they are dead and that they have a chance to go to a different world. All they have to do is complete some sort of task while they are in that world, like kill the demon king or a specific enemy. You get the gist of it though, I could have named about 20 other shows that do the exact same thing. The other route, I'll call get me the fuck out of here as soon as possible, which you might be able to understand without me explaining it. Basically, the main character is either forcefully pulled into or sent to another world, much like the first route, but instead of leisurely hanging out in that new world, they want nothing more than to leave it. Their reason for wanting to leave this new world varies, but for the most part it is because they still want to live their life out on Earth. Back home, they have people who love them, and a whole life ahead of them, that was taken from them the moment they landed in this new world. The Visions of Escaflone exemplifies this concept perfectly. Spoilers for that show if anyone cares, but Hitomi, the main character in that show, is in love with someone on Earth. After falling into the portal to a new world, she still harbors emotions for the person on Earth, and would like to find a way back to Earth in order to complete those feelings. The get me the fuck out of here as soon as possible route was very popular back in the day, around the 90s and early 2000s. So there is a clear separation between these two different routes, and that line ends up somewhere around 2010. I know that War on Geminar was only one year before that line, but it follows the same rough pattern. At the beginning of the show, it is made very obvious that Kenshi is willing to do absolutely anything to try and get back to Earth. And even as the show goes on, he constantly references people that were in his life before he was transported to this new world, always mentioning how he needs to find a way back home and back to his family. Uh, look, all I'll say is that it stays true to the formula. Around halfway through the series, they forget about the whole I want to see my family thing and Kenshi's just alright with living in this new planet. I'm not wrong in saying that this show follows the formula, okay? It just so happens that this isekai has both routes in it. Nothing more. But uh, moving on from that, I'd like to show you the wonderful world that is Geminar. Even though Kenshi does not want to be in this world, it's still a very cool and well thought out world that has some very interesting features. You've probably seen these things floating around in the background, and I haven't really talked about them until now, but these are mecha. Yes, this is a mecha show. To be more specific, these are called mechanoids, a type of biomechanical weapon that is used throughout the world of Geminar. They are the shape of an egg when they're not activated and only take form when they come into contact with a pilot. Each mechanoid has a different build that is unique to each pilot, varying in their colors and shape. The people who pilot these weapons are called the Mecha Masters, and all have the training in order to pilot these weapons. Not everyone is born with the ability to pilot a mechanoid, though. It is a trait that is usually passed on through genetics, but can also appear in random children. While most Mecha Masters are female, occasionally males are born with the trait, and are highly sought after, as they are considered rare and often highly skilled. The mechanoids are powered by an energy called Aho, an invisible intangible energy that flows through the air and is condensed into the mechanoid. While the mechs themselves aren't equipped with weapons, they have the ability to wield a multitude of different armaments. It depends on the pilot's fighting style, but you have the choice of any weapon you'd like, as long as it's big enough for the mechs to carry. 
And honestly, it is such an interesting system that I haven't really seen before, even back in Mech's heyday, and especially after Neon Genesis Evangelion brought biological mecha into the spotlight. I've been ranting for quite a while about the mechs, and you may think that I have explained everything there is to know about them, but there is still a plethora of knowledge about them that you learn through the show. Just know that it's a very complex system that just makes sense. The mechs aren't the only system that's very complex either. The geography of this world is filled with its different quirks. While you never get a map of each country at play, you often hear a lot of different names and places pop up through your watch of the show. You learn different pieces of information as the history and culture of each country starts to become more clear. Even during seemingly useless conversations between unimportant characters, you pick up something new about the world's locations. As the show goes on, you start seeing these different places you've been hearing about, and you get to see how visually different they are. In normal isekai, you often see towns that have very similar designs as the main character traverses through the world, with the only difference being the names of each of the towns. But in War on Geminar, each country has their own unique design, and each design has a reason behind why it looks like that. It could be because the country is a peaceful place and does not have a lot of wars or that it's a very old country that has been alive for a very long time. It's very interesting to see each of these different places and see some of the people that inhabit them. And not to spoil anything, but there are a lot of different characters in the show. That is called an expert transition from world building to characters. Okay, not really, but we'll let it ride for now. The characters of the show at first seem like your average run-of-the-mill characters you could find anywhere. But you would be oh so wrong. I don't want this to turn into a character analysis video or spoil some character arcs, so I'll keep this short. This is Empress Lashara. She is a very interesting girl, a 12-year-old who was suddenly thrust upon the throne after the sudden passing of her father. And that's not a spoiler, her coronation is literally the first scene in the show. Anyways, she is now the ruler of an entire country at a very young age and has to try and use her wits in order to bring success to her empire and lead her people well. This monstrous task is obviously very hard for her, as she is still very young and the responsibility of Empress is a large one. Now, I should maybe preface this, but you don't actually see any of this happen. But this is obviously because she tries to hide this burden from everyone around her, and that includes the people that are watching the show. It's just heavily implied throughout the story that she's having a hard time. Other characters, like Kiaya, also have very interesting backstories and character developments. She has an affection towards a certain male student, specifically named Dagmire. Affection is a very light word. While they did grow up together and were friends for a while, Kiaya ended up very attracted towards Dagmire, inevitably trusting everything he says. After an altercation with the, as of right now, unnamed bad guy, she notices something similar between the people she is fighting and Dagmire. Eventually, her love blinds her from any clues that could lead to Dagmire being evil, and instead trusts that Dagmire is innocent. When you hear this, you might think something along the lines of, wow, she's pretty stupid, but, uh, but actually it's a very real emotion, where sometimes we end up averting our eyes when it comes to the people we love, especially the negative. Now, the characters aren't perfect, I will say. They are all in love with Kenshi. And, and I mean all of them. Yeah, yeah, the cat's out of the bag. This is a harem anime, okay? I couldn't hide it for much longer. It basically slaps you in the face as soon as you start watching the show. They slowly introduce a plethora of different women into it. I think the line, there are more female mecha masters than male mecha masters, should be enough to tell you that it's a harem. But so what? There have been good shows that feature a harem and the sun hasn't collapsed. It doesn't take away from the excellent character development this show has to offer. It's just that the character development usually involves wanting to have sex with this man. And I don't see the problem. Alright, now that that's over, I want to start talking about some of the action that goes on in this show. I mean, it's a mecha show, right? It's gotta have some good action. While the animation is a bit yikes at times, the action that this show has to offer is generally well thought out, even if it's not done amazingly. Most of the show has been hand-drawn, so all of the mechs that move around, the machines on display, and all the actions that they take are all drawn out individually. It's got a very classic feel to it, and classic in a good way. With the New Age Mecha, the actual machines are usually 3D rendered, which gives them a very rigid feel and aren't as smooth as hand-drawn mecha. Especially for biological mechs, it's really nice to see more natural movements come from them. Well, at least there's a lot of different fighting styles in this show. You have a few hand-to-hand -hand combat units that excel in close-range fighting. There's a few gunman units, and seeing the main characters try to work around the guns is really interesting. 
Okay, okay, maybe the animation and the action isn't that good, but there's still a lot going on in the show. It's not like you can blame the animators for their work. It's a lot of mecha to draw, and I'm sure that it was on a tight budget. It can't be that easy to animate this entire show to their best standards. But I wouldn't say the animation is all that bad. There are a few moments where the animation really gets to shine. And that's when they are fighting outside the mechs. Obviously, in this world, not every battle is done inside the mechanoids. Sometimes it is necessary to take it outside the cockpit and fight with more barbaric means. The best example of this is during Episode 6 when there is a massive pillow fight. During Episode 1 when Kenshi has to fight off a horde of people who are trying to kill him. The martial arts used here are very clearly animated and each move makes anatomical sense. It's not a whole army of people fighting him, but each one actually looks trained to fight. They're not just randomly attacking Kenji. They animate the fight in such a way to make Kenji look incredibly strong, without making the people he's fighting look incredibly weak. I know it's only a short portion of the show, but it shows just how good the animation could be, not necessarily how it is. No, I'm not going to bring up the pillow fight scene. Okay, fine, but only because it is pivotal to the plot of the show. Sometime in the middle of episode 6, the gang are taking a vacation to Havonawa, a technologically advanced country, and the home to Princess Maria and Flora. In this country, there is a certain welcoming ceremony to introduce foreign correspondents to the country, as well as celebrate their safe travels. In this party, there is a game being played, called the Pillow Fight, set up in a large room where the ground is covered in futon, and each futon has their own pillow. But the Havonuan pillow fight is much different from the one that we have grown to know. No, in this game, there are clear winners and losers. In order to beat everyone else and claim victory, you have to be the last one standing against an onslaught of different opponents. In this fierce game, alliances are made and grudges take form as people duke it out with the chance to obtain the victory. I'm gonna skip over the how you win part, but just know that it's absolutely crucial to the overall plot of the show. But what this goes to show is that the different places in this world are full of their own unique quirks, with their own traditions, ways of celebrating, and people that inhabit these countries. It also goes to show how in-depth this show really is, and the time and effort needed to create this world. But even after that masterful explanation, you might be wondering the history of this welcoming ceremony, and how it came to be in the first place. And that leads me to another very interesting thing about the world of Geminar as a whole. You see, Kenshi is not the only one that has been sent from Earth to the magical world of Geminar. Actually, it seems like there's been a lot of people from Earth that had been there before. But getting people from Earth to Geminar is not a simple process, as the stars have to align in order to do it. Quite literally. You see, Geminar exists somewhere in the solar system, the same one that Earth is in. In order to take people from Earth, there has to be a direct connection to Earth, and that can only happen when the stars are outside the path from Earth to Geminar. But this isn't just a contrived plot point that is created in order to bring some relatability and normality into this world. The reason that these people are summoned to Geminar also makes sense in the context of the story. Male Mecha Masters are highly sought after in this world, both for their ability to create more Mecha Masters and their skill on the battlefield. While it is possible to get some Mecha Masters through diplomatic means, as in trading and selling, it is also possible to summon more of them from Earth. While it is a very difficult feat to accomplish, it is worth it in the end if you end up getting another male Mecha Master without having to buy them. The people from Earth that were summoned to Geminar were not kept as slaves to the country that summoned them, though. They were given royal status and could basically do anything that they wanted. Because of that, the people of Earth would often come to Geminar and implant a lot of Earth's traditions throughout the country and throughout the world. There are traces of this through the series as well. Like when the Mecha Masters graduate the Academy, they are given formal attires they are celebrated for passing the Academy. Uh, or the swimwear that the students of the Academy use when they are doing their training, and, uh, I don't think I can show this one on YouTube. That's also the reason I can't show the openings and endings, cause, uh, well, there's, there's actually a lot of things that I can't show you, but it's not the anime's fault. It's not that I can't show you these things, it's that I don't want to. Because at the end of the day, everything I show you could be a spoiler for this amazing show, and I believe that you should watch it for yourselves. Fine. It's hard to call this show amazing. It's hard to call it a good show at all. Now that I think about it, you can't even call it a show. There are just too many problems going on in it. It's way too long, the animation isn't that great, its characters are surface level with little to no personality, and they spend way too long on plot points that have little to no influence on the real story. But there's just something so genuine about it. 
It is isekai trash. There is literally no argument against that fact, but it's so stuck in its own world. It's in the middle of this content gray area where it is exactly what you are expecting, yet so different from anything you have ever seen before. You can tell there was a lot of heart put into this, which is arguably what kept my attention for the longest. Each episode brings along a new plot point or a different situation that is just so close to hitting the mark but falls short nearly every time. But it doesn't give you that same disappointment you usually get when that happens. It's almost endearing in this show. It's like watching a puppy run into a glass door two times in a row. You root for it to learn how to get around the glass, and maybe it does, but you know damn well an hour later he's going to hit his head again. By no metric is this a good show. Bad plot, bad animation, bad characters, bad setting. But damn if I don't think that it's the best isekai. My name is Laszlo, but you'll remember me as a random guy on the internet. Thanks for sticking with me. See ya.